Hey, it's Mike Andrews. Just wanted to let you all know that today's episode contains some mature topics, and we do encourage you to use your discretion before listening with your kids. Affirming a delusion is not love. Lying to someone is not love. Protecting someone from themselves when they are being irrational and want to hurt themselves is love. When I said I was fat, the adults in my life disagreed with me and were like, you're dying. But when I said I was a boy and I was born in the wrong body, adults agreed with me. They agreed that I was messed up and they helped me hurt myself. Welcome back to The Narrative. Mike Andrews, Aaron Bear, David Mahan with you for another episode of the podcast, and it's great to have you here. We are officially into June, which means as far as our clock goes, gentlemen, we're just two months away from this special election that's coming up to present issue one before the voters that would elevate the constitutional threshold up to 60% of the vote. And we talked a little bit about it last week, Aaron, but I know that you really want to to press our listeners on this county captains initiative that we've got going on. And we're trying to get as many people in as many areas as the state on board with with what we're doing to try and get people to the polls for what could be a, a pretty low turnout election, but could be very consequential in terms of a, a lot of important policy issues in Ohio. No, I, absolutely. I, I got to say. Mike, when you started off saying we're officially into June, I thought you were going to acknowledge that, you know, David decorated his office like a Target uh, store <laughs> with all the, his, his pride paraphernalia. Pride yeah, and about that's June the, 12th, which that, is my birthday. Holla at your boy. Yeah. <laughs> now, this is the, the, the time of year where every parent tries to shield his kid's eyes for 30 days. Well, but. I was going to say maybe Pride Month, David, is Aaron's opportunity to celebrate the two of us because I've got a June birthday as Wait, well. Whoa, so, whoa, you know. Whoa, man. <laughs> Man, you gotta be careful because that's a sound bite. Exactly. <laughs> that one's just for you, my that, friend. That, that's just for you. Yeah. Right. Uh, but uh, to, 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 to get us back on track, that's my fault there. Uh, yes, yes, it is. Uh, exactly. Um, county captains. Yeah. Uh, Mike, you know, we, we are in a, a dead sprint right now uh, to uh, August 8th. Uh, the, the issue one is now, you know, kind of the language is certified. We've got a uh, the title of it, um, and we've got the the ballot language out there, uh, and in you know less than about eighty days now, we're going to be voting on whether we elevate the threshold to amend the constitution to sixty percent. Um, and again, this is bigger than just the procedural question. Uh, this is the question of whether uh, we're going to protect the constitution to the best of our ability from having abortion on demand without parental consent put into the constitution, sex chain surgeries without parental consent on minors put into the state constitution and really a parade of other crazy leftist ideas inserted into the constitution, you know, everything from election integrity to, uh, you know, their, their gerrymandered district lines to, um, minimum wage increase, tax increases. I mean, you kind of go down the, the gambit and they've made it really clear. They want to put their entire political agenda to the constitution. And this is our best opportunity to protect it. And so, um, the, the baseline, as you said, turnout's going to win or lose this election. Um, and what can really make the difference there is if churches are driving people out to vote, registering them to vote, getting them, getting them praying now. Um, and so, you know, we've got probably almost half the counties represented now with, with county captains. We need more uh, in those counties along with covering the other counties. Um, so if we get the question all the time, what can I do to help right now is the time for you to sign up to be you know, working with the team. We'll help you contact churches. You'll be the resource hub to get things all over your county, um, whether it's it's you know voter registration kits or uh, you know other educational materials, flyers, uh, yard signs, all that kind of stuff. We, we, we need to get this stuff distributed, and we've got, we've got less than no time to get it done. Uh, so ccv.org slash county captains is where you go to sign up. Uh, Sam and the rest of the team will be in touch with you uh, when you do, but we, we need you now, church. It's one of those situations. We've talked about it before. You tend to hear after a big election, well, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. whether, whether it's positive mm -hmm. or negative, whatever the outcome is, there's always those people say, I didn't know what was at stake. And that's something that we heard with some of these abortion ballot initiatives that uh, pro-lifers have been over six on since yep. the overturn of Roe last summer. But this is our response to that, that's to right. say, we want to mobilize you to tell your neighbors, to tell your church, to tell people in your county what's on the line and to help get them to the polls to enact this very important legislation. Yeah, we've been running across the state uh, for the last several weeks now, and we're starting to hear back from a lot of folks in communities saying that they're seeing people collecting signatures, 
um, you know, $25 an hour from Michigan. The videos are popping up all over social media where folks are recording these guys, you know, who are collecting petitions. And uh, and it's kind of got a, a buzz going, you know, wow, I can't believe that they're lying about this and they're they're working so hard or out of state. And that's what we mean by our Constitution is not for sale right now. It is, you know, when, when you can afford Planned Parenthood can afford to pay twenty five dollars an hour, one hundred fifty dollars a day for meals, three to five dollars per signature. Um, they are buying their way into our Constitution Now we can curse the darkness all we want. But my thing when I'm talking to folks across the, the state is if we don't work at least that hard, we lose. That's what happened in Michigan. And when it's not going to happen here in Ohio, OH. That's right. <laughs> David, as you have spoken about this kind of in the early stages, what kind of response are you getting from people when you tell them about the initiative and, and this opportunity? To it's get been involved? phenomenal. It's been phenomenal. So, um, you know, there, there is this this wanting to stay away from politics, you know, that we always here. Um, but they're seeing this as a special opportunity for the body of Christ to engage because there's no RD on this. It's just an issue. What does God say about this issue? How should the body of Christ respond in kind? And so um, it's just been a really cool opportunity to, to really talk about the issue, educate folks, and then give them ways to plug in. It's been amazing. We'll move it on to our next topic for the news segment today. Wanted to highlight an legal opinion that the Ohio Attorney General Dave Yost issued last Friday as far as transgender bathroom use regulations go. And Aaron, just to, to tee us up to kind of give us the civics lesson, what is an attorney general opinion, um, maybe not specifically in a case like this, but just in general, why do people or why do counties ask the attorney general to weigh in with an opinion like this? Yeah. And this is something that, you know, every state is a little bit different, right? When, when I was in the Arizona attorney general's office, we would put out opinions kind of opining on uh, how to interpret the law right and, and again it's it's always it's always hard to um w with these things because there's certain things that an attorney general can talk on and there's other things that they can't because a lot of cases are very fact specific but you know broadly speaking the way an attorney general opinion would work is in this case you have a prosecutor the green county prosecutor uh that uh, wanted to get the attorney general's perspective on how to properly interpret the laws so as he's sort of executing his duties as a prosecutor, right? And so he can ask sort of broad principle questions, right, that, that the attorney general can can give a perspective on. Um, and But if he tries to ask specific questions around sort of a fact-based situation, the attorney general tends to not opine on that, not give his opinion on that, because, again, those things can can change depending on all of the different facts and you know, you, somebody might present a situation to you and not present all the facts. So he, attorney generals tend to avoid those types of questions. Um, these don't necessarily have the force of law, but they give an idea of how, uh, how the law should be interpreted and how judges and, and other prosecutors uh, would, would interpret it. So an attorney general opinion is a, a very important tool. Again, it's, it's one of these things, and as we talk about this, this situation, um, and again, actually, it's a, a very important situation going into to Pride Month. Yeah. Um, but as we talk about this situation, um, you know, the th this shows that what, what I love about this attorney general opinion, this situation broadly, is it shows how important state government really is. Right. And the things that most folks don't pay attention to that actually have sweeping impacts uh, on our day to day lives. Specific to this case, David, can you give us a little bit of background on why this request came out of uh, Greene County and what what is motivating the request for this clarification from from the attorney general? So we, we've touched on this a little bit before, but there's this trans identified male, um, Darren Glines, um, who liked to hang around in the women's locker room. Uh, looking literally just sitting there naked um, in the locker room for quite a period of time, looking at women and little girls. Three families finally went to the YMCA there in Xenia, uh, protested. Uh, they said policy and law in the state of Ohio says that he has every right to be there. Um, the we met every last one of these um, um, these individuals and their families. It's just horrific um, stories about, you know, it's the first time my 11 year old little girl saw a man completely undressed was in that locker room. Um, and so, you know, we had a trial, uh, we were there. Um, what it came down to, Mike, was he got off. Um, 
those uh, they lost their case because he had a flap of skin that covered his genitalia. Um, and so based on our law, um, if you do not see the genitals, then it can't be um, charged as indecent exposure. So he literally, they, the, I listened to the defendant, um, the, the, um, the lawyer say that you have to redefine the definition of naked based on my client. This is, it was sickening. But what we found out since then was there was another, um, there was another person who submitted testimony. Uh, her name is Katisha. She was from the Fairborn YMCA. Right around the same time, he was, um, you know, taking heat for watching little kids and women. And Xenia, he befriended this employee in the Fairborn YMCA. Um, she actually helped him lawyer up. She felt sorry for the guy. Um, um, began to have a relationship and, and talk on the phone. She started saying, I talked to her just not too long ago. She said it started getting really weird. He started talking about these weird fantasies, asked about her personal sexual uh, activities. Um, she thought it was just a part of his transition, um, that he was just working out who he's becoming. They go to breakfast at the Waffle House and he gropes her on um, you know just a simple hug as they were saying goodbye and he grabs her genitalia. Uh, and her behind. Um, she filed, um, she got a restraining order and um, they actually have it on record um, uh, that it was sexually motiv motivated. Um, and so none of that came into account during the trial. So we literally have um, a perv, right? As somebody who's actually got a restraining order for what he did at another YMCA, he gets off and he's, he's, he's allowed to watch little girls because of his weight. In that context, in this situation that, that David just described, the Greene County prosecutor, who's the one that initially filed the charges against Darren Glines, uh, one of the things that was sort of unclear about this was uh, what are the laws around what's generally called public accommodations, right? Um, and so he wanted to, you know, th this is where, again, we're, we're going to get deep tracks here <laughs> into state government. But it, it, this is a, a great story uh, that highlights the, the impact of state government and why things matter, right? Uh, because here you have a prosecutor, a county prosecutor, looking at a situation that I think everybody can agree on is is incredibly dangerous and offensive and, and wrong, right? And he's trying to actually do something about it. One of the first times I've actually heard of a county prosecutor doing something about it. Well, the first question is, can the YWCA, was it YW or YM? YMCA. YMCA. Why, why, why can the YMCA say only men are allowed in uh, men's rooms and only women are allowed in women's rooms, right? And and using what everybody up until five minutes ago understood was a man and a woman, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, he needs to know, hey, can, can, can we actually do that, especially in light of a U.S. Supreme Court decision, yeah, the Bostock, Bostock. case mm -hmm. that, that we've talked about on this before that was a, a case that said, uh, unfortunately, it was a bad case for us. Neil Gorsuch actually ruled against us uh, and said that, uh, you know, you can, in employment, you can't uh, gender identity and sexual orientation are actually included in the term sex. That's a lot more that goes into that. But that's just for employment, just for employment. Right. Well, you know, again, getting deep tracks into Ohio law. We have something in Ohio called the Ohio Civil Rights Commission. Right. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of folks are familiar with this. This is a commission that the governor appoints and the Senate uh, confirms. A lot of folks don't pay attention to who gets put on the Civil Rights Commission. And by the way, you know, a lot of the people that want to be on the Civil Rights Commission tend to be pretty far left. And Ohio's Civil Rights Commission, despite the fact that we have mostly conservatives uh, running state government being an elected position, our Civil Rights Commission is actually very far left. Uh, and they have taken an interpretation uh, that says, you know, under Ohio civil rights laws, even though we don't have sexual orientation and gender identity as pr protected class, they are taking the Bostock case and saying, well, this Bostock case that even though it specifically says is only limited to employment and employment in, in specific circumstances, they're saying, nope, this anytime you see the word sex, you also have to read in sexual orientation, gender identity. And this applies to Ohio. So that's the opinion that that's that's what uh, the Civil Rights Commission is saying in Ohio. Uh, and this is our questions that the uh, that prosecutors were asking, hey, 
Attorney General Dave Yost, how do you view this? And that's what led to this opinion. And just to, to read, I think, one of the more clear and maybe concise points that the Attorney General makes in this is, he says, allowing men to share bathrooms, changing rooms, and locker rooms with women increases the ease with which biological males, most especially men who identify as men, can victimize women and girls. So he comes out with a pretty clear statement against that line of thinking, correct? That, that's right. So this what what Ge- Attorney General Yost did phenomenally here is, again, within the, the confines of his authority as the Attorney General, he was asked four questions. Um, and some of the questions he was able to answer, like, does the Ohio Civil Rights Commission, are they the final word on interpreting Ohio law? No. And he said, no, absolutely not. That like they have an opinion and but that does not make what they are saying true. And in fact, by the way, here's all the reasons why I don't think their uh, uh, opinion is actually r- correct. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, the second question, and th- this is where that quote you just came from, is does, uh, you know, basically does the Bostock case prohibit uh, YMCA or any public accommodation uh, from saying, no, we're only going to allow biological men in men's bathrooms and we're only going to allow biological women in women's restrooms. And he said, absolutely not. The uh, Businesses, public accommodations can absolutely say we have sex segregated uh, facilities for biological men and biological women. Again, I'm it's so cumbersome to actually have to actually say biological men and women, right? We right. we all know what we mean, like when we say men and women. We don't, biological is, is nonsense to have to add to it, but that's that's what he came out and said very clearly. Which again, it's going to send shockwaves uh, to a lot of corners of the state. But that's why I want I want to get back to what Katisha was talking about because this is a young lady who is highly supportive of all this trans ideology. Um, she actually said that before um, the incident and learning about what Glines did in Xenia, um, she was completely um, oblivious, never thought about how self-identification could be abused in this kind of context. Um, whenever somebody brings something like up, like what, what um, AG said, um, the first thing is, well, you're saying that everybody who identifies as trans is a predator. That's not what everybody's saying. We're saying that it it, it takes away all of the const- the restraints for allowing predators to access these facilities. Um, and that's what Katisha was was actually talking about. Um, she said for her, it was world shattering was was her um, her exact words that when he groped her, she was a survivor of sexual abuse when she was younger. And when she was was groped, all of the things that she suppressed, all of the reality and the truth behind this issue, um, that she suppressed came sh- like just crashing down on her all at once. Like this is exactly what we wished would never happen, but it just happened to me. And Dave, this is why I, I love this podcast so much. Like what we get to do on this, it, because I think for a lot of us, especially for for Christians who you know are are deep into the worldview culture and and we're we're we're, we're well versed on these things, we rightfully see sort of transgenderism and transgender ideology as as pure evil and and perversion like we're we're never going to hide from from that fundamental reality of what it is right it is uh it is dangerous and it is harmful absolutely we also though you know as a as a as pure like what do we do now with this right we we fight against the harm of it um but we also need to be persuading people right and and i think for a lot of us it feels at times hard to believe that anyone would genuinely think that a man can become a woman, right? Or that, you know, that somebody could possibly use these uh, these laws for, for you know, preying on, uh, on young girls or women, right? Katisha said, I mean, yeah, there was fear, but I felt like no one could actually get away with that. Exactly. Right? And, and, <laughs> and again, like two seconds of critical thought, I think for most people would be like, oh yeah, this is, this is wrong. But the reality is for most, for, I don't know if I'm going to say most, but for a lot of people, we should say they're genuinely blinded by this, right? The, 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 when every single medical institution, every single media outlet, every single authority out there that is left of center is saying, yes, men can become women. And how dare you question it? People fall for it, right? People, and, people and they're get lying. Into it. They're actually lying about federal court cases right. in, in the actual opinion on page 31 
they literally say under Title VII, we do not purport to address bathrooms, locker rooms, or anything else of the In the, the kind. Bostock case, yeah. yes, in yeah. the Bostock case, yeah. page thirty-one. They never talk about that. Mm -hmm. We get to encourage the body of Christ to to say it's okay to speak up on these things, right? Like you're not crazy and you're not unloving to to address these issues. Like certainly we always want to treat individuals that are struggling in these areas with the kindness and compassion that they deserve as image bearers. But we can go after ideologies. We can go after organizations that promote them and say, this has the potential and is actually hurting people and give the body of Christ evidence in situations in which this has occurred so that they can be bolstered in their arguments and speaking up against it. No, that, that's right. And, and this is, if, if we're going to, you know, really save the the culture save the country from a, a you know as, as Philip Reeve calls it a death work that is destroying people we need to we need to understand where people are actually at with it and be able to attack it right and this is why I, I love Katisha's story is because she is someone who genuinely thought she was pursuing the good or, or genuinely was in her mind pursuing it, right? This is she was preparing a protest for the guy. Yeah, like like she, she and and so by all means, was she actually doing something harmful and wrong? Yes, right. We we don't want to we don't want to act like hey, you know, her heart was in the right place, so she should follow her heart. That, that's not what we're saying at all. But we need to understand where she's at so that we can persuade these types of folks like this is actually wrong because a lot of them, like Katisha, like we see in her journey. They're, they're much more open uh, to the realities once they get exposed to it. Yeah. And so this is this is what we're trying to do in this whole process is how do we truly expose folks to, to the reality? And that's that's what we're trying to do here. For her, just to, to your point, Mike, it moved from ideology, right? Like you said, we can oppose ideology. We can oppose this. She realized that this isn't just an ideology. This is a person. This is a predator. And if she doesn't speak up, other people will be harmed. And it kind of ties into our special interview that we've got today as well. We had the opportunity to talk with a couple of young ladies who bought into this ideology. They went through various degrees of transition processes and were living as men to whatever extent that they were able. They've come out of that and now they're going around, they testify against or testify in support of bills like the SAFE Act. And that's when when we got to talk right. with them when they were in Ohio a couple of weeks ago. And, and Chloe and Prisha uh, sitting in that room across from the table with them when we had this interview, David, you can you can kind of set it up maybe better than I can. But you, you can hear it in my voice at certain times in that yeah, interview. The, I think the we things were all that fighting tears. It was, yeah, it was the, horrible. The things that they relay from their experience are just heartbreaking and gut wrenching and whatever adjective you want to put in front of it. And, and it's powerful testimony to this end of we need to get these messages out to amplify these messages so that that people can see the harms that happen this is definitely one family that uh that you need to share broadly um when we invite people in to testify or even to be on the podcast um, we build a relationship with these folks chloe had come in before we eat lunch and dinner with these folks we we have conversations over the phone before they get here um these to, to hear them share um, in in this kind of informal context, the deep, dark um, experiences that they've gone through, uh, through their, quote, transition, how they relied upon the people that were supposed to help them, um, and, and they just kind of got harmed by them. Um, this is something that every woke church needs to hear, every pastor who's afraid to deal with this issue because we don't want to offend anybody. Um, these people need protection, right? Kids that are struggling with gender ideology, they need protected just like kids that are being indoctrinated by gender ideology. And that's a great setup, David. And with that, we'll toss it to a quick break and come back and have that special interview with Chloe and Prisha up next on The Narrative. Hey, Narrative listeners. You know, Christians in the marketplace today face more unique and challenging threats than ever before. Businesses are following woke capitalism, chambers of commerce are beholden to social justice, and secular activists are chipping away Christians' First Amendment rights. As Ohio's only Christian chamber of commerce, the Christian Business Partnership stands in the gap to advocate for, to educate, and to celebrate Christian business owners. Joining the partnership also allows businesses to provide their employees with health care insurance, workers' compensation, 
and exclusive banking and educational discounts. To find out more and to join, go to cbpohio.org. That's cbpohio.org. We've got Chloe Cole and Prisha Mosley, who are detransitioners, who now are kind of on the national circuit, so to speak, to speak out against this uh, so-called gender affirming. It's more like gender denying care. And ladies, I just want to give you some time here up front for our listeners who might not have seen you in, in media or follow you online or anything like that to tell your stories a little bit. Give us a back, uh, some background on yourselves. And Chloe, we'll start with you. Yeah, thank you for having me. So I'm a detransitioner and a former trans kid, I went through the process of socially transitioning and medically transitioning and stopping transition all while I was still under the age of 18. And for me, this spanned um, between the ages of 12 to 16. I started socially transitioning at 12, starting with um, cutting my hair shorter, um, changing the way I dressed, presenting myself differently, and then changing my name and eventually having a coming out of sorts to my family and some friends. And then at 13, I was rushed into medicalization. I was put on puberty blockers. And a month later, a month or so later, I was put on testosterone um, while I was just in my, my eighth grade year. And the summer after my sophomore year, when I was 15 years old, I underwent a double mastectomy and my breasts were permanently removed. And... It wasn't long afterward that I stopped transitioning because I realized that I regretted it, that huge parts of myself as an adult were being taken away while I was still a child. And in losing my breasts, I lost a huge part of my sexuality and I would never even have the option of breastfeeding my kids. I would never know what it's like to, to bond with them in that way. And Prisha, can you tell us a little bit about your story as well, please? I was 15 years old when I began my social transition with such a long list of pre-existing diagnoses that I got a very young borderline personality disorder diagnosis. Um, despite that usually not being given out to kids, I just had so many other underlying things. However, this was all pushed aside when I uttered the word gender. And in fact, my therapist said that all of my problems were because I was born in the wrong body. So I was fast tracked at 17 years old when I mentioned this to my doctors and um, put on a very high dose of testosterone. And about a year later, my healthy breasts were also removed. Um, and I was given informed consent for this, but I was not allowed to give informed consent for liposuction um, because I was too mentally unstable. So we, we just, um, you know, we had the uh, HB 68 hearing for the SAFE Act, the Ohio SAFE Act, and you all have come in to uh, testify in support of that bill, did a phenomenal job. Um, like I've, I told you yesterday and even today, I hate that you have to get up there and share those things. And to the audience, um, it could be tough to hear some of the details of what they went through, how they were groomed with the social transition, um, how that led to being exploited um, with the cross sex hormones and the puberty blockers. And in your cases, uh, the surgical procedure. So this could be hard to hear. But I believe that one of the reasons why so many in the church, in the body of Christ, are slow to respond or react to this issue is because of a lack of knowledge. So, yes, this is some hard, difficult information to hear. Um, but uh, would you mind sharing some of the details of, first, the social transition? Is that a big deal? You know, what's happening in the schools? What does that look like in America? Oh, it's a huge deal. Um, I never learned about this from school personally. It was all social media for me. I mean, I graduated high school last year and I'm from the middle of California and yet this was never presented to me in class ever. I never heard about gender or sexuality or how my identity related to any of that stuff. Mm. But I didn't really have a whole lot of friends in school and... I'm the youngest of five kids and all my older siblings were moved out by the time that I was in fifth or sixth grade. And so I had turned to the internet and I started using a phone when I was 11 years old. And I started using social, me I started using social media like Instagram and Snapchat because that's what everybody else my age was doing. Most other kids my age in, in my grade level 
had actually gotten phones much younger than I had. And I wanted to know what I was missing out on. And I wasn't exposed to this at first, but a lot of the content that I was getting on Instagram in particular was about sex. And there was a lot of there were a lot of images of women in very sexual situations right. with very sexual undertones. Many of them were doing certain poses or they had a very specific body type. Like they had very they were very curvy and they were showing that off. And I would compare myself to this a lot. And it exacerbated body image issues that I already had because I started puberty at a very young age and I would often compare my, compare myself to other women. And because I feel, felt like I wasn't very feminine as a person or in my body, and because I didn't really want to be a woman, I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be seen as weak or stupid, and I didn't want to deal with things like periods or female puberty or pregnancy or childbirth. I felt like I would never make a good woman ever, and it was actually through like fandoms around things like anime, video games, okay. and comics that I liked. There a lot of users in these communities, for some reason there was a lot of there was a lot of overlap between that and identifying as LGBT. And many of these users were transgender. And many oh. of those transgender users were young women quite like me. And just and their posts that weren't related to these media, they would talk about their own personal lives and how they felt about themselves, their bodies, their families, their their upbringings and their interests. And so, I felt like I really related to these people. So let me jump in there, Chloe, because it sounds like one of the words that came out of the terms that came out over there was social contagion, mm. right? And so, and you just brought up a really good point that these aren't just video games. These aren't just videos. These aren't just websites. These are communities. It's the people around them, yes. Right, that lead to social contagion, right? Um, which is what we call the, the whole social transition piece um, of a four-step process, right? Mm. What was your situation with the with the whole social contagion piece? So um, as I was saying in my testimony, I fell victim to two social contagions, and the first one was anorexia. I was looking at thin women and models, and they were – being praised much like trans people are praised and worshipped today. So I wanted to be like them. And then when I successfully reached my ultimate goal weight of 85 pounds and was still unhappy, trans adults found me and told me that I was born in the wrong body and that's why I couldn't eat and I still wasn't happy even though I looked perfect. I couldn't be a woman right. I wasn't doing it right because I was a boy. Um, I had a legal name change as a minor. Um, this caused huge rifts in my family. Um, as well as it, it made my mental health worse. And um, as a person who suffers with psychosis, it made my delusions worse. So what was the next step beyond the social transition? What was it that caused you to begin seeking the, the medical interventions or surgical interventions? I was told online by trans adults that I needed a letter of recommendation, which would unlock hormones and surgery, and that if I didn't do that, I would kill myself because as long as I wasn't aligned, like my bi my mind and my body weren't aligned, I was at risk for suicide. So I went online and just by myself Googled gender affirming therapists without my parents, and then I had one 15-minute appointment with her where she gave me letters for hormones and surgery that I took to an endo a pediatric endocrinologist and had one appointment and was injected with testosterone. Yeah, for me, I wasn't as viciously or directly preyed upon because when I first started browsing these communities, I wasn't really directly interacting with anybody. But I was very interested in all this because the way it was presented was very, very cheery, very rainbows and lollipops and all these like all these colorful flags and these new terms to describe oneself were all so new to me. And I was at an age where I was already questioning where my role was in the world. And I mean, at first I kind of, I switched between different labels before I finally settled on being a boy because it just made sense to me that I didn't want to be a girl. I didn't feel like the other girls. And the only option left for me was being a boy. 
And so, I mean, I really looked up to the the men in my family, and I wanted to be more like them. And the research that I had done on transitioning, um, and the information, which included information that I had gotten from the trans community itself and from official medical resources, seemed to point to medically transitioning as the only means of treating gender dysphoria. And I wanted to start going on the path of transitioning, not only socially, but medically. And I knew that I needed to get my parents and family involved. I didn't want to leave them in the dark. And if I wanted to, to go through the, the medical route of things, I knew I would have to have my parents sign off of it. Let's, let's talk about that for a minute, because there's a lot of parents listening, right? And so all of this research, all of this deep dive into identity mm-hmm. was happening at what age for you, Chloe? Um, I was 12 going on 13. 12 going on 13. So what was your parents' response to all of this? Yeah, I was actually, I was very fearful of how they would respond because I knew they loved me, but I didn't really know how, what their response to this would be. And so I decided that I would write them a letter and just, just give them, give them some time to think about it. And their initial response was mixed they Mm. wanted to be supportive of me and but they didn't really exactly know how to go about me having these feelings okay and so they decided that well it's clearly a mental health issue so i should be sent to a therapist okay and then so you get to the therapist and with your parents Mm. and what were you know i heard what some of your parents heard and um but what what did they hear in terms of the solution to what you might be going to? What, how was, how was your, what was going to cure the mental distress that you were experiencing? I mean, at first it was, they were just asking like, how, what do you identify as? Okay. What do you want us to refer to you as? What pronouns do you want us to use when we're talking about you to other people? And they pretty much strictly took the affirmative approach. My doctors did. And there really was no proper questioning of where these feelings come from. And they knew that I had a previous diagnosis of ADHD and other underlying issues, but they just, they failed to consider that it might be influencing my desire to become a boy. Or it was it was all just treated as like a standalone yeah. condition. See, that that's, that's and, what was, I'm sorry, I, I, you know, over in the hearing, what was so disconcerting was that many of... On one side of the aisle, they were wanting to know about the W path, you know, guidelines and mm. things like that. But it sounds like so many times, even with you, Prisha, it was like there was a self-diagnosis, mm-hmm. right? First, there was fear from the parents that said this is, you know, an issue, something psychological going on. They took you to a medical professional. And then you sit down in front of the medical professional with your parents and they say, what do you self-diagnose as? Yeah. Right, right. And that was the foundation for all of the care that went on from that point on. Is that correct? Right. It's pretty yeah. much a self-diagnosis, yeah. and the treatment itself is even led by the patient. But mm-hmm. they – I don't remember being there for this. I think they. this might have been an appointment that my parents – that they had without me being there. But um, my mom and dad were getting really concerned because I was starting to push more and more for the the physical interventions – and they wanted to know why, why I was pushing for this so so hard. Okay. And they brought up their concerns to the doctors asking like, well, I mean, is there another option? Like, what, what, what are the regret rates for this? And they were told, oh, it's very, it's very uncommon for patients to regret these types of or procedures. I mean, really, it's maybe less than one or two percent. But if... You don't allow your child to transition. And the reason why she's pushing for this is because she she knows what she wants. I mean, children, it's very obvious that children already know what gender they are from a young age. Normal children don't want to be the opposite sex. She knows exactly what she wants. So if you don't affirm her, you're either going to have a dead daughter or a live son. Did you have that? I mean, I hate, I hate hearing that, and um, it was, it was rough hearing today, even in the hearing as you all were standing there. Um, Prisha, was that kind of your situation as well um, with family? Did you hear statements like that? And 
um, dead daughter, live son type thing or, you know. Yes, absolutely. It's almost like they have a script. I actually have international friends who are D-trans who reported hearing the same thing. But they asked my parents in front of me, do you want a dead daughter or a living son? Do you want to pick up his hormones or her body from the morgue? Um, it's horrible. My previous suicide attempts were used as proof that I wasn't being affirmed fast enough. I'm picking up some common themes. And as David pointed out, there's that that thread of this is a suicide risk if you don't treat this. But you also both mentioned the idea of being like fast tracked or pushed and some other underlying issues. Like, why are these things all being conflated in this way where it's as you said, the same script, like there's just this script that everybody goes through. And now people like you are starting to, to push back against that. Um, what is it that's motivating them to, to do this pushing and this fast tracking along these, uh, these lines of medical intervention? My letter of recommendation for surgery literally says that being born in the wrong body caused anorexia, OCD, borderline personality wow. disorder, anxiety, and depression. So they were saying that it was this underlying issue that was causing the other issues, not the other way around. Yes. Correct. Wow. Well, I mean, it is very ideologically motivated. I mean, there's no, there's really very little evidence to back up this treatment mm -hmm. for gender dysphoria. I mean, it's a physical intervention, the removal and changing of completely healthy body parts for the sake of treating a psychiatric disorder. And I think I think we need to get into that piece now. Um, what I hear from so many parents, um, you know, going to churches or just, you know, running around family members. They're always talking about we need not to engage this this area because of love. We need not to engage. Right. It's, it's almost like the whole um, concept that that uh, affirmation equals love and healing. Disagreement equals hate and harm. Therefore, it's more harmful to engage and not use pronouns and things like that. It's less harmful to just go with the flow, right? And I'm not hearing that from you all. I'm hearing that there are some very psychological as well as physical consequences to transition or gender care. Prisha, what, what do you think about that? Affirming a delusion is not love. Lying to someone is not love. Protecting someone from themselves when they are being irrational and want to hurt themselves is love. When I said I was fat, the adults in my life disagreed with me and were like, you're dying. But when I said I was a boy and I was born in the wrong body, wow. adults agreed with me. They agreed that I was messed up and they helped me hurt myself. Um, so let's talk about the tough piece of what it's like to live in your skin now, right? So after you were socially transitioned, after, you know, you, they affirmed your identity, you know, with cross-sex hormones, puberty blockers. Now, uh, Chloe, you are what age? I'm 18. 18, Prisha. 25. 25. Um, you've decided to detransition, right, um, to identify as your biological self. So isn't that the end of the story? I wish it were. I mean... I have lasting complications from every single one of the treatments. And the regret and the psychological trauma is one thing, but the way this has affected my body and my the the functioning of my body and also my body image, it's been really tough to recover from. I mean, I'm a lot healthier than I was while I was going under this, while I was living a lie and taking these unnecessary treatments, but it's still something that affects my day-to-day -day life. It's, I have to bandage up my chest every day because of the skin grafts. And just looking at my chest and my underdeveloped body, I feel like a large part of, of me as an adult, my sexuality has been taken away from me. And it's something that just because of because I'm young and because of the embarrassing nature of it that I don't really talk about, but I am experiencing some form of sexual dysfunction. Krisha, I know you're going through a lot too uh, from testimony. Um, whatever you're comfortable with sharing uh, as to what you're struggling with now physically, please. Uh, 
um, kind of share that with our audience. So um, the first thing to change on testosterone is what they call bottom growth. Mm. Doctors will tell you that when you're a girl, this is your penis growing, but that doesn't happen. That You can't change gender and you're not growing new body parts. It's the enlargement of the clitoris, which has twice as many nerve endings as the penis, and um, it's incredibly painful. Um, I have trouble wearing certain underwear, and as for the other part of my, like the rest of it, my reproductive system has atrophied away. Um, I can't even use tampons without tearing myself and bleeding. Um, I'm trying to have a healthy relationship with someone I love and I feel like I'm robbing him of normal things and of my breasts. Um, right before I quit testosterone, I began to have the beginning symptoms of, u symptoms of uterine prolapse. Um, where you essentially just give birth to your own uterus. Like it's so atrophied and it's folded over that my body was rejecting it. Um, I suffered with bursting ovarian cysts for years and I just went to the hospital and they would just give me morphine and tell me it was normal for a trans man. Yeah, they, I remember during one of my appointments for hormones, my endocrinologist told me about some of the potential side effects, which included um, that it might be more difficult for me to conceive a child, but also that I might experience vaginal atrophy. And I was just 13 years old. I didn't know what this meant. I had never, I wasn't sexually active yet. I I'd, I'd never had sex. I didn't know what that would really mean. And I was just told like it will, it's the thinning of the tissues and it will cause some discomfort and, but you can um, address it using topical estrogen. And about a year or so in, I started using that, but I wasn't told that the atrophy can actually affect other areas, other organs in the pelvic region outside of the reproductive system. So while it addressed the atrophy within that specific organ, I still was experiencing atrophy within my, my urinary tract and so I was prone to infections and I, it actually got to the point that there were times when I had blood clots or even tissue in my urine. So, so that, that leads to the question of consent, right? I mean, how, what is the conversation that you have with a child about what you just experienced, what you are experiencing, mm. my God, the today experiencing? How do you explain that to a child or a child's parent to be able to inform? A parent cannot consent to harm for their child. They can't consent to harm their child. Um, and, and, but, but yet this is being presented as the healing, right, um, that is needed to keep that child alive. No way. Um, yeah. You all are, are part of a large community. You've traveled the nation, are traveling the nation. And again, I cannot thank you enough for, for being here in Ohio to stand for our children, children that you don't even know, that don't even know your name. I'm fighting tears. This is a hard one for me. But in the community that you are part of, um, what are you hearing from, from those young people. There were folks that were here last year testifying mm. that were not here this year because of what they've experienced with attacks from, you know, uh, the culture. Um, is that a real thing? Like, what have you all experienced just trying to do the right thing and advocating for children? It's very, very real. I mean, from the very beginning of my detransition, and even just the regret setting in, I received a pretty hostile reaction from the trans community before I stopped transitioning when I was talking about how I hated how testosterone made my face look and how I wanted to have plastic surgery to look the way that I used to, I was told by somebody that I was being a spoiled brat, that I didn't deserve parents who would let me go on these treatments or doctors who would give me the go to go on them. And I was told by other people um, in the earlier stages of detransition when I first started speaking out, um, privately on my personal social media that in transitioning and regretting it, I stole resources from transgender people mm. who really needed it and that I was harming them just by talking about my experience. 
I was I was shamed. I was I was blamed. I was told that I was three. I I was thirteen, not three. That I should have known exactly what I was doing to myself. Yeah, for sure. What what kind of love have you experienced from this uh, this community that so embraced you? Uh, maybe a couple years ago, but but now that you have chosen to be your authentic self, um, we know what the medical community has done. They won't take care of any, you know, the issues that we're dealing with right now. But how has that that community um, either embraced or rejected you? So I think my favorite compliment is that I am a foot soldier of genocide. Um, like I've been told that, um, that I am killing kids. Um, I want kids to kill themselves and they're cutting because of me. Um, again, with the stealing resources from actual trans people, um, I get death threats like all the time, people doxing me. Um, it's very difficult, but I just keep telling myself the only thing that's scarier than that happening is what happened to me happening to someone else. What would you both say were the watershed moments for you, um, those moments when you thought that the interventions had gone too far or weren't producing the results that they wanted. And then secondarily to that, the moments when you went from just attempting to detransition personally to now wanting to speak out against this. I mean, personally, I never really felt any regret or questioned my transition at all until after I had the double mastectomy. And the post-op process was very difficult for me to deal with, with having to to take care of the wounds and bandage them and the skin grafts all on my own. But that was roughly when I started to realize, like, it was a lot more than I had bargained for. It was very difficult to to fulfill the role of being a male socially. And while I did pass very well as the opposite sex, I felt lonelier. It was a lot, as a guy, it was a lot more difficult to be more intimate in my relationships with my family and my friends. And it was seriously affecting my, my, um, my dating pool. Like all, all my friends were starting to get into relationships and get their first boyfriends and girlfriends. And I had nothing other than maybe a few people who saw me as nothing more than a fetish. And this loneliness that resulted from transitioning um, led indirectly to me getting exploited in another way. And I turned to online dating and sexting both online friends and strangers because I felt like I was lacking something and really I just need I just I needed a hug more than anything but I also started to hate how it made me look I mean the the high from looking masculine being handsome and girls having crushes on me was starting to wear off because I was still still attracted to 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 guys but because I looked like one of them I didn't really have a chance with them and now I didn't really I didn't really care for this. And I missed things like having long hair, being able to to wear things like skirts and dresses. And sometimes in private, I would wear like some of my old girl clothes and some makeup from the drugstore. But I was ashamed because I didn't even look like, like a girl anymore. And I kept this, this to myself. But the thing that I, I started continually, I continually went through a, down, a downward spiral emotionally. But the thing that really took me out of it was in my junior year when I was taking a class in psychology and towards the end of it, it was more focused on things like family and and children and the psychological development of a child. And the thing that uh, really got me, I mean, it was it was the first time that I had really been learning about this kind of thing in depth. And I realized, like, I have a maternal instinct. I want to have children of my own one day. But there is a, I can't remember the name of the researcher, but it was an experiment done on rhesus monkeys on, on, on infants. And they had surrogate mothers made of either cloth or wire. And... Just learning from that how things like breastfeeding and physical affection affect the bond between a mother and her child 
and how that bond affects that child's cognitive, emotional, and social development down the line really just made me feel like a monster because I didn't have my breasts anymore. I wasn't going to have that option. Neither of my kids. So um, detransition for me was a two-part step. I first medically detransitioned and did not socially detransition and start living as a woman until a couple years later because of the shame. But when I medically transitioned, which is where I stopped poisoning myself with hormones and scheduled no more surgeries, it's because I got into dialectical behavioral therapy. It's the treatment for borderline personality disorder invented by a borderline, and it helps with black and white thinking, emotional distress tolerance, and stuff like that. And then, like... Everything that was supposed to happen when I transitioned, the euphoria, the magic, it all happened when I healed my trauma. And then I was like, I could have done this without cutting off body parts. I just wanted to be not suicidal anymore and I had trauma to heal. Then when I socially detransitioned, I met my current boyfriend whose daughter was two and a half at the time. And despite dressing as a man, looking as a man, I had facial hair and everything. She called me mommy. Um... And I knew I wanted to be a woman and I wanted to be a mom and I couldn't pretend anymore. And I um, started getting laser and living as a woman again. There's a lot of talk of research over there in the hearing today. And um, suicide tends to come up an awful lot. And I Mm -hmm. think those that are listening today um, who know very little about this topic, um, they just feel like, well, these kids are suicidal. Right, because they think they're this, and so that's what we have to do. But the best science on the planet says that the suicide rate goes up 19 times yes. post-surgery, post-transition. But the interesting thing about that that research was that they didn't recognize that for 10 years, like 8 to 10 years, right? And and I'm hearing that in your testimonies as well, is that there was a euphoric time. There yes. was a time frame where this was awesome. You were being love-bombed by a community you were getting the attention that um, that you feel like you needed, right? We all need attention. We we're born for that. But but then there was this: the honeymoon was over. Yep. Right. Testosterone and cross sex hormones. Um, testosterone has a known um, confidence effect, and it can really help with depression. And estrogen has a known soothing effect. So when people are reporting gender euphoria, they're literally just high. Right. The problem that I had with therapy throughout my transition was that once all the euphoria of being on these treatments started to wear off, I just went back to baseline. And during every therapy appointment, the first thing they would always ask was, how is your gender dysphoria doing? The problem was always made out to me to be my gender dysphoria, even as I advanced more and more into my transition and I looked like I was the opposite sex and I was receiving affirmation from just about everybody around me. But it was always made to be, the issue was always made to be my gender. Even as it was clear that the more, the further I got into transition, the worse my condition was getting. Well, as we start to to wrap up our time here, I just want to ask, because you've both touched on the, the social aspect of this, mm. for for the moms and dads out there that, that maybe have kids that are being exposed to this, uh, what what would your advice be to to help their kids through, to help them not walk on the, the path that you had to go down to learn these lessons the hard way? Keep them off of technology and especially social media as much as you can. I mean, ideally, you should start at a young age and not let them use the internet or or a phone and so maybe until they're in their late teens but until then they should be focused on physical activities like in-person activities and they need to have a community around them whether that means they're in a club an extracurricular or a sport and I think sports are especially important because it's There is a focus on the body, but on the performance of the body and not the appearance. And I think you really learn how to appreciate it without really focusing on how it looks, but rather what it can do for you. And you're also working in a team with other people towards a goal. And that's something that 
is especially important for children. They need to have a sense of purpose. Please learn the difference between validation and affirmation. All children need and crave validation, but you do not have to affirm their feelings as true to say that they are real. I am sure that the trans identifying child really feels distress in their body and gender dysphoria and that is real, but it is not true that they were born in the wrong body. So validate their feelings, but do not affirm a lie. Do not affirm a delusion. Tell them that you see their pain and you see their hurt and you hear them and they care, but don't tell them that what they believe is real. Don't agree with them that something is wrong with them. No child is born in the wrong body. Right. And stay as engaged as you can as a parent in their lives. On that note, Chloe, um, I'm going to ask both of you one question pertaining specifically to the church. Mm. Um, Christians who, in America, whenever something goes wrong, the people to stand up and help is usually the first, you know, the, the people of God. Mm -hmm. um, Prisha, um, how can we pray? There are folks, first of all, hundreds praying for you all right now. <laughs> right now. I know that for a fact. Um, many of them have been texting me. Oh, I can't believe they said that to her, blah, blah. They're praying for you right now. But um, even as I, I sit across the table, I see a lot of, you know, you, you're going through some things and this is not easy for you. So how can believers pray specifically for Prisha? This is a hard question. I don't think about just myself too much. Yeah. Um, I want to stay strong enough to help other people. So if God could grant me the strength to keep it up, that would help. Yeah, I can see That's that. That's beautiful. That's right. Chloe, um, we had time of prayer with one of the state reps uh, mm. last night. I thought that was very sweet, you and uh, my buddy. Um, there are a lot of folks on the sidelines that just don't know what to do, don't know how to engage, to use your terms. Um, you're out there on the front lines engaging every day, sometimes feeling alone, right? Um, how can they engage in a real way? Yeah, I'm trying my best to get this information out there to as many people as possible because the reason why it's gotten to this point is because for so long it's just it's been brushed off as some niche issue that most people think will never affect them or their family but this is the breakdown of reality of tradition and it's something that we need to uphold um so stand for truth yes okay and it will it won't be easy that's right it will not be easy and the reason why a lot of people don't speak out is not only because they don't know about it but because they don't know how to go about it and they're afraid of losing their jobs and you might you might but you can always freshen up your resume and how can they pray for miss chloe well i think we need to pray for the healing of every single detransitioner out there and everybody who has been through this process and for those who are uneducated about the subject for them to learn and for the families and children out there who are being affected by this and for those who feel as though they cannot speak out. Yeah. I um, would also like it if we could pray for people who still are trans. And I would like to say, mm -hmm. I, I don't hate trans people. No. I love trans yeah. people and I have empathy for the suffering that they are going through. But trans people are hurting demographic um, and they are being abused by medical doctors um, just because they're hurting. Um, so if, if you guys want to direct your prayers for them, they are in pain. That's yes, right. please. Yeah. Thank you for that much needed reminder. Um, and thank you so much for this time today and for your perspective on this issue. You're out there doing the hard work. We recognize that. Uh, and just as a final word, thank you for your courage to be able to stand up against this. Uh, I hope that we can see generational change because of what the two of you and others Absolutely. like you are Absolutely. doing. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time. Thank, Thank you. you guys for giving us a platform. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of The Narrative, presented by CCV and produced by Westler Media. If you found today's episode insightful, leave us a review or rating and subscribe anywhere you get your podcasts. 
We're your hosts, Mike Andrews, Aaron Bear, and David Mahan, and we'll see you next time on The Narrative.